Thank you, everyone. Good evening. If those who are standing and just coming in would, would quickly find a seat, we would like to begin the program. Thank you, and thanks to each of you for being here this evening. I'm Ron Williams, the Vice President for Student Services, and I'm honored to stand before you this evening to welcome a giant in the, in the field of uh, poetry and, uh, and uh, as a prolific writer. We're very honored to have Nikki Giovanni on our campus as we uh, culminate Black History Month, the month of February, and begin Women's History Month the month of March. So it's very appropriate, very timely. Western Illinois University, you're in for a treat this evening. I had the pleasure of having lunch with Nikki Giovanni this afternoon, and she is just a delightful person, a down-to-earth, delightful person who I'm sure will share uh, some, some things with us this evening that uh, you, you will remember for a lifetime. Um, with that being said, again, thank you so much for being here this evening, and I would like to welcome Stephanie Hopsepian to the stage to, uh, to bring you greetings as well. Hi. Oh, thank you. We're getting energized. Um, so hi, my name is Stephanie Hopsepian. I'm the director of the Women's Center, as Ron said. And today begins Women's History Month. And the Women's Center has a variety of programs planned for March to help us celebrate. Our theme for the month is Women Undefined. My team and I came to this theme after assessing and examining the programs and specific women who will help us celebrate women's history. Instead of thinking of the category of woman as stagnant or singular, we realized women are so amazing, we resist the category itself. Hence our theme, right? Nice. Hence our theme, Women Undefined. We hope that you'll join us for upcoming programs this month. The Women's Center is honored to share this evening's spectacular event, The Words and Brilliance of Nikki Giovanni, with the Gwendolyn Brooks Cultural Center. For us, tonight's event is a celebration of the intersections of race and gender, or put another way, a collaboration that bridges Black History Month and Women's History Month. We are at the doorsteps of activism, engaging the potentialities of women, and engaging in the history that is now. We are grateful, so grateful for the opportunity to delight in the words and power of Nikki Giovanni. So thank you, and now I'd like to invite Michael Williams, director of the Gwendolyn Brooks Cultural Center. Good evening, students, faculty, staff, and community members. I am Michael R. Williams. I currently serve as the director of the Gwendolyn Brooks Culture Center, located here at Western Illinois University. The center was founded in 1969 and officially named after Gwendolyn Brooks, American poet and author in 1970. Born in Topeka, Kansas, Gwendolyn Brooks was the first African-American Pulitzer Prize winner, awarded status Poet Laureate of Illinois, and the first black woman appointed to as consultant in poetry to the Library of Congress. As we bring forth the month that, which heightens black history to a close, the Gwendolyn Brooks Culture Center would like to thank the faculty, staff, and students that have participated in this year's theme, Expression, the Doorsteps of Activism. Since our Martin Luther King Jr. celebration, we have been challenged and bothered by injustices, visible or invisible, by systemic and institutional systems. We have seen the beauty in Alice Walker, the wisdom of George Washington Carver, recited plays from stellar African Americans who have participated in American literature discussed the rumble in the jungle, viewed women of the Black Panther Party, celebrated black excellence, and remembered that athletes can do more than shut up and dribble. Taste of Cuisine from the native African countries identified the strategic placement of Martin Luther King monuments, and we visited the beautiful land of Wakanda, a land in which we hope to transition the mindsets of education, inclusion, and justice, and the truth of the world as we live today. As a collective, the Multicultural Center aims to be inclusively inviting and intentionally recognizing our civil responsibility to host and aid in difficult conversations with partners near and globally. I would be remiss if I did not recognize the contribution of the following sponsors in abiding and bringing our respectable keynote here today. The Black Student Association, Equal Opportunity and Access, the Black Student Summit, 
the English department, the Centennial Honors College, Liberal Arts and Sciences, African American Studies, I thank you for your support in this event. Now I would like to bring to stage Mr. Brian Jackson, Vice President of the Black Student Association to introduce our keynote for this evening, renowned poet and civil rights activist, Nikki Giovanni. Can everybody hear me all right? All right. Nikki Giovanni is one of the best known African American poets who reached her prominence during the late 1960s and early 1970s. Her unique and insightful poetry testifies to her own evolving awareness and experiences from child to young woman, from naive college freshman to seasoned civil rights activist, from daughter to mother. Frequently anthologized, Giovanni's poetry expressed strong racial pride and respect for family. Her informal style makes her work accessible to both adults and children, in addition to collections such as Recreation, Love Poems, and the Collected Poems of Nikki Giovanni. Giovanni has published several works of uh, nonfiction, children's literature, and recordings, including the Emmy Award nominated The Nikki Giovanni Poetry Collection. A frequent lecturer and reader, Giovanni has taught at Rutgers University, Ohio State University, and Virginia Tech. Giovanni was born in Knoxville, Tennessee in 1943, the younger of two daughters in a close-knit family. She gained an intense appreciation for her African-American heritage from her outspoken grandmother explaining in an interview, I come from a long line of storytellers. This early exposure to, pow to the power of spoken language influenced Giovanni's career as a poet, particularly in her propensity towards colloquial speech. When Giovanni was a young child, she moved with her parents to Knoxville to a predominantly black suburb of Cincinnati, Ohio, but remained close to her grandmother. Giovanni was encouraged by several school teachers and enrolled early at Fisk University, a prestigious all-black college in Nashville, Tennessee. The, a black renaissance was emerging at Fisk and as writers and other artists of color were finding new ways of expressing their distinct culture. In addition to serving as editor of the campus liter literary magazine and participating in the Fisk Writers Workshop, Giovanni worked to restore the Fisk chapter of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Giovanni graduated with a BA in history in 1968 and went on to attend graduate school at the University of Pennsylvania and Columbia University in New York. Giovanni's first public published volumes of poetry grew out of her response to the assassinations of such figures as Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, Medgar Evers, and Robert Kennedy, and the pressing need she saw to raise awareness of the plight of the rights of black, black people. Black feeling, black talk, and black judgment display a, a strong militant African American perspective as Giovanni explores her growing political and spiritual awareness. These early books followed by recreation quickly established Giovanni as a prominent new African-American voice. Black Feeling, Black Talk sold over 10,000 copies in its first year alone. Giovanni gave her first public reading to a packed audience in Birdland, the new famous New York jazz spot. Critical reaction to Giovanni's early work focused on her more revolutionary poetry. Some reviewers found her political and social positions to be unsophisticated, while others were threatened by her rebelliousness. Nikki writes about the familiar, what she knows, sees, and experiences. Don L. Lee observed in Dynamite Voices One, Black Poets of the 1960s. It is clear why she conveys such urgency in expressing the need for black awareness, unity, solidarity. What is perhaps more important is that when the black poet chooses to serve as political seer, he must display a keen sophistication. Sometimes Nikki oversimplifies and therefore sounds rather naive uh, politically. However, Giovanni's first three volumes of poetry were enormously successful, answering a need for inspiration, anger, and solidarity in those who read them. She publicly expressed the feelings of people who had felt voiceless, finding new audiences beyond the usual poetry reading public. Black Judgment sold 6,000 copies in three months, almost six times the sales levels expected of a poetry book. As she traveled to speak, to speaking engagements at colleges around the country, Giovanni often hailed as one of the leading black poets of the new black renaissance. The prose poem, Nikki Rosa, Giovanni's 
Reminence of her childhood in a close-knit African-American home was the first published in Black Judgment. The, black, the poem expanded her appeal and became her most beloved and most anthologized work. During this time, she also made television appearances, later published as Conversations with Margaret Walker and James Baldwin. Members of the audience, please join me in welcoming Nikki Giovanni. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. It, uh, it was one of the, if not the original, Gwendolyn Brooks uh, Black House. And we have the trees there. It was, a, it was an honor to see the, the two trees. And we have that space. And I know that Michael is working on it. And uh, I hope that, that we can be a part of it. This has nothing to do with anything. <laughs> it's just something that was on my mind. I run a poetry contest at Virginia Tech. Virginia Tech is my first real job. I had little things, but the first job that you took that you had to be someplace and, you know, they expected you and you get a check every two weeks and you have health care, you know, that kind of crap. <laughs> and, and I run a poetry uh, contest there and it's called the, it's called the Steger because the president of Virginia Tech is Char was, he, he's retired now, was Charles Steger. And Charles took me out to dinner one night and, and said one evening, and he said, you know, Nikki, because he had enough sense to know that even though he's got Virginia Tech, he needs to do something. He said, Nikki, if I gave you $1,000, could you run a poetry prize? Could you do something with it? And I thought with $1,000, sure, I could do something. You know, anybody can do something with $1,000. And so, you know, if you got another thousand, you could too. And <laughs> I thought about it and I said, well, yeah. But what I decided to do was to not break it up. Because I thought if I break it up, it'll be a mistake. If I say, oh, $500 for the first prize, you run a, a contest. You know, 300 for the second, 200 for the third. You see what's going to happen. But if I leave it at 1,000, then we can add to it. And we in Virginia, Tech in that area in Blacksburg are very fortunate, and I don't know if, if any of you do or don't like ham, but we do Smithfield, if you like Smithfield ham, that's where it comes from. And the, uh, what do you call it, like the, the president of Smithfield ham, I guess they all get sick of me at some point. And so finally, we went out to lunch, he invited me to lunch, and he said, if I give you $50,000, would that help? And I said, yeah, I could probably do something with it. <laughs> $50,000. So now I have a prize that I'm calling, that I do call, the Steger Poetry Prize. And we now have the $50,000, more or less. I need another $50,000. I'm 74 years old, and I'm going to retire soon. But I'm going to, I need another 50000 So if I have the 100000 the prize can pay for itself, and I don't have to worry about it. It's just one of those things. But it was like, OK. Let's see what, what, we can, what we can do. We have the prize. The prize is now 12 years old. I'm extremely proud of it. This is a long story to say, because we are here and because I have an admiration for what Michael is trying to do and is doing, and because that is sacred space, and because I really love so much, as all of you know, a woman named Toni Morrison who was one of the most brilliant women in America, even though she's an AKA. <laughs> we all make mistakes. <laughs> and Tony wrote a book called Beloved. And in Beloved, she says, when we look at slavery, there's, no, there's not even a, a bench at the side of the road. There's no place to rest. And this is a long way, and I guess awkward at this point, of saying what I want, and I, 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 I mentioned it briefly to Mike, what I want is for the Steger Poetry Prize to put a, a, a bench in that sacred space that was the Gwendolyn Brooks Sign. 
And I'm, I'm sure that other people, I'm sure that the Gwen, I'm sure that the Tony Morrison people will join, but that's what, when I go home, that's what we're gonna do, so that when you see that space now, or when, you know, as soon as we can get the, the bench there and get it, it will be, because Gwendolyn started all of the poetry, so it will be that space from the Steger Poetry Prize. I think that that's, I think it's so important that we recognize how important you all, you all are. So, yeah. And, and I thank you for that. I was also born on June 7th, and Gwen was born on June 7th, and um, Prince was born on June 7th. <laughs> so June 7th is a good time if you're not doing anything to be born. <laughs> now we know Prince's people to be fools, so we know that we, <laughs> if you know anything about them at all, you know they are. So I don't know what they're going to do, but that's something else to remember when we look at that space, that June 7th is an important part of the space. I'm so proud of Western that you have continued to take those next steps. And I know that it's not, it's not easy and it's not going to continue to be easy, but you've got sacred space. And this has been a year which has nothing to do with this thing I'm supposed to be doing for you. But this, is, <laughs> no, this has been one of those years where I've gone places that I don't normally go. I was in Greensboro, and I happened to meet the governor who probably would do anything in his life never to have to run into me again. <laughs> and I said to him, it's true. I said, Hi, I just wanted to know, how come your license plate doesn't say Greensboro 4? How come the, the license plate of North Carolina doesn't say that? Because the most important thing that happened in North Carolina was the Greensboro 4. And then I happened to be, <laughs> if you call that a happenstance, then I was in uh, Arkansas. And of course, I think that should say Daisy Bates and the Little Rock Nine, you know. That it's time that we, you know, black people get tired of being not recognized. And it's, it, it's time that we recognize the importance of what we have contributed to this, to this nation. It, 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 that doesn't cost anything, put it on a damn license plate. That doesn't cost, <laughs> it, it doesn't. But it's something we need to think about. Of course, somebody will say, I don't want no niggas on my license plate. Well, we didn't want no white folks on ours. So, <laughs> it, it'll balance out. <laughs> and I just think it's time that we started to, to think about what it is to be inclusive. This, this is 2000, this is 2018. And we're gonna have to start thinking about how we get to how we become more inclusive. And it just doesn't take that much. Black people are probably the greatest people on earth because we're such low, we're, we're low rate, we're low maintenance. All we're looking for is every now and then, not even every damn time, just every now and then a smile. Just every now and then. When you steal from us, just admit that you stole from us. <laughs> no, that's, that's true. And, and it, it, it goes back to, it, it, we start with your basics, and, and I was laughing about it earlier. We're the only people in America that didn't, that didn't come. <laughs> Y'all came and got us. They said, we want to have a nation. They did. They said, we want to have a nation. And they looked around and said, what do you need? Well, we got Europeans, we got this, we got that. And somebody looked around and said, we don't have no black folks. <laughs> and they said, well, we don't need black folks. Said, yes, you do. We can't have, have a nation without black folks. So they went and bought us. Now we can also talk about the history of us being sold because you know three white guys didn't wake up in the morning and say I'm gonna start the slave trade. So we know that, that that was a part of the ugliness but we know that that was a part of it too. But they came and got us. And as they got us, we know that one of the interesting things for those of you who are history majors, we know that that 10th day of, of uh, 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 it's not underground, of, of uh, coming over on the ship Thank you. <laughs> that tenth day is going to be that day that the enslaved realized, because they could come up on the second and third day, they could look up and say, oh, there's the ocean, there is our land, we know where we are. On that fourth and fifth day, somewhere along there, they could look at the, at the uh, 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 clouds. And as we know, clouds over land are different from clouds over water, so they still knew where they were. But it's going to be that tenth day that they're going to be in the middle of the day and uh, of the ocean and they're going to realize we don't 
we have no way to know where we are or how to get back. And that's going to be the day of rebellion. This is my point. And in that rebellion, the men and women who were white, who were on that ship, are all going to be armed because they know that the black people, when they bring us up, to clean us off because the ships are gone like this. So you know you have to be cleaned off. They're going to throw the water on. You know you have to jump up and down because if you're going to, make a, if you're going to have anything to, to sell when you get over here, you're going to have to have it in shape. Am I being awkward? Do you understand? Am I making sense? So we're going to do it that way. So when they come up and they look and they don't know where they are, they are going to rebel. Now we know, and this is sad to all of us, we know that many are going to be killed. Some are going to jump overboard because they don't want to do it. But some we're going to put back down under ground, under the, the ship. And the people that are under are going to recognize wherever I'm going, it's unknown. We do not know where we are going. Now, I happen to just, because I believe in black women, I happen to think that it had to be a woman because it's women that recognize some of these things. And it's going to be the women who are recognizing my people need comfort. They recognize that. We're here. We have been defeated. Wherever we're going, it's going to be really different. We need comfort. There is no, as we all know, there is no such thing as an African language. African language is like the European language. Everybody has their own language. We know that what we call tribe, that you all would call communities if it was white. We know that, that what, what we, we know that there's Germany, we know that there's German, we know that there's French, we know that there's Italian. Am I making sense? But when we look at, at the African continent, we know that there were different people speaking different languages. There was no common language. So we know that that woman who is now back in the hole trying to find a way to comfort her people could only turn to one thing, and that's going to be And on that ship coming here, she is going to invent what we are going to ultimately call the spirituals. We know that by the time she gets here, we still don't know. We don't know English, and we don't know how to speak to anybody else. But the one word we're going to learn is sold, because they're going to put us on, 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 on blocks. And they're going to say, whatever, 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 sold. Whatever, 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 sold. So the first English word that we learn is sold. And we're going to be sent to communities. We're going to be sent out to work on plantations. We're going to be sent out to do work, and we're going to have to learn the language that they are speaking so that we can learn what it is that they want us to do so that we don't have to get beaten for not doing it. And we are, in our spare time, going to come back to a song when the evening is. We're going to come back to each other to build a community. And I think it's just disgraceful that we have not given the black community the credit that we deserve for building those communities. We know that we got the leftovers of the food. We know that, 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 they, that, that they got the big part of the pig, we got the chitlins. I never do understand why black people don't eat chitlins. Our grandparents ate chitlins, our great grandparents. Chitlins are important. You clean them and you eat them. But we also know that we who cooked for the white people, and nothing wrong with that, we cook for them today. But we know that we who cooked for them, we know that they want it because they wanted the best. That's, that's nature of white people. They wanted the best, and so they wanted the leaf. They wanted the greens, and they gave us what is now called the pot liquor. And with the pot liquor, what nobody recognized is that the pot liquor was the better part of it. And we grew strong. And we also, again, still, we had a song. And now we had a God because we recognized that Jesus was talking to us and that Jesus was looking out for us. So we're going to embrace Jesus. And I got to tell you, one of the things that you have to love about Jesus, no matter what your religion, this is not Nikki's religion. But when you think about Jesus being on the cross and you think about him being up there, the man on the right, you remember the cross? But the man on the right said to Jesus, hmm, you say you God, but you up here like the rest of us. If you, you can look that up, it's, it's in your New Testament. The man on the left said, I believe, Lord, that you are God. And Jesus said to the man on the left, you will be with me in heaven. And Jesus had enough sense not to try to talk to the fool on the right. 
And you and I have to have enough sense not to talk to that fool in the White House on the right, too. <laughs> you know, that's true. We're going to come here, and we're going to find another, another song. And we're going to go from the spirituals, and we're going to go into the blues. I'm a big fan of the blues, and I got to tell you, if there's one, and I'm not, I'm in a good mood today, and I hope that nobody thinks I'm not, but if there's one woman we have to love, and I mentioned her early, you have to love Bonnie Raitt. And you have to love Bonnie Raitt because Bonnie Raitt loves the blues. And because she went through a lot of trouble, she continues to go through a lot of trouble to make sure that the blues people have their fair share. Now, I grew up, I want to read you a poem. That was a long way to say I want to read you a poem. I grew up with a woman, she's wonderful, called uh, uh, Big Maybell. I don't know if you all know, probably most of you don't, if you all know Big Maybell. Big Maybell was a blues singer, and Big Maybell was big. <laughs> and everybody, she, she had a couple of hits. Her big hit was Candy. And everybody, Candy, I call my sugar candy. And I had a boyfriend, as we all do, and <laughs> we do. And, and one of the things, my boyfriend, uh, his name is Nate, and I still don't know why, to tell you the truth. I don't know why my mother liked Nate, because Nate, I think he was a crook. I'm not sure that we, <laughs> I'm not sure we called it that, but Nate, you know, I do have to just mention this. One of the things that makes black people angry <laughs> is that when we do things, it's illegal. And once everybody gets it out, and then white folks get to do it, it's, it's all right. So when we were doing it, it was called the numbers. And the numbers were illegal, right? And so you had to get rid of it. You run the numbers, you get arrested. <laughs> when white folks took over the numbers, <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Then it, came, it became the lottery. <laughs> and everybody loves the lottery. <laughs> and so that's going to be one of those things. I, I'm going to find this poem because I don't ever remember any of my poem. I, um, I know it's here. <laughs> there we go, but I don't have a number. So one of the things that, um, that I want to do, Nate knew that I liked the blues. And so Nate came and asked my mother one time. He said, I have a, um, I have a treat for Nikki. And I don't really know why my mommy let me go because she knew that... Um, she knew that Nate ran the numbers. It's what they called in those days, ran the numbers. She knew that Nate ran the numbers. But for some reason, totally unknown to me, she was like, okay, Nikki can go. And so now we're gonna go to a nightclub. And the nightclub, of course, is gonna be in, uh, I'm in Cincinnati at this point. The nightclub is gonna be in, uh, in uh, Newport. And Newport was the dirty money, Cincinnati was the clean money. And that's the way that kind of went. I don't think that you have any, I don't think we have any um, uh, situation like that here because it seems like, you know, we're here and you guys seem to be, I don't, I don't know what relationship uh, uh, Peoria has to you all, but Newport is on the other side of the river and so it had the dirty money. But Nate, mommy liked Nate and mommy trusted Nate and so she was like, okay, you can take Nikki. So now I'm going to get to go see Big Maybell. And I'm excited because I love the blues. I still do. And I'm a jazz fan, but if I had to pick, I could pick the blues. So Nate is going to take me. That was in the days, by the way, that I wore high heels and dresses. I haven't had on high heels and dresses, I bet you, 20 years. But at that point, you know, because you want to look nice because you had a boyfriend and you wanted him to look nice. And I knew that Nate did, did something that probably wasn't exactly kosher, but it wasn't my business to judge. It was my business to look good if I'm going to stand beside him. <laughs> so Nate has now taken me to see Big Mel Bell. Probably most of you in this room don't know Big Mel Maybell. See? You see what I'm saying? And thank God for Bonnie Raitt because Bonnie has brought her back up. But I knew her. We're there. The room was dark, dank actually. It was, after all, Newport, Kentucky, preserver of sin and soul. My boyfriend, whom my parents trusted, though Nate did not deserve their trust, 
was taking me to a nightclub. George Raderman would be sheriff one day and close down Covington and Newport, and Cincinnati would suffer. Cincinnati had gotten the clean money, the living room, Mark Murphy, Les McCann, the mighty, mighty Amanda Ambrose, fresh from Chicago. Newport had the blues and gambling, though the biggest gamble was probably with your life. I wore high heels then and dresses just a bit above my knee. I drank gin fizzes because, let's admit it, that's not a drink. Nate and I had a, had a Nate said, I have a treat, so mommy let me go to a bar that was dark, down dank steps, where I coolly walked in with one of the gamblers who knew everybody. We could see through to the back before the performers came to the mic. The stage jiggled, and candy <laughs> was shouted out. I call my sugar candy. And there she was, two times of incredible womanhood, balanced on stiletto heels, wrapped in a black silk dress, talking about her candy. And I, who was born in Knoxville, Tennessee, met one of Tennessee's greatest gifts to the world, the girl from Chattanooga. Shake it, baby, shake it. This woman would never sell Girl Scout cookies or be seen collecting for diabetes. She would never make calls for crippled children somewhere in Africa, nor head up the blood drive in her hometown, no. She'd be leaning on the back fence in a man's pair of house slippers with a cigarette just sort of dangling between her lips, laughing, laughing, laughing. Yes, ma'am, this was Big Maybell. I stamped and clamped and clapped and shouted, shake it, Sister Maybell. Go on, girl, shake that thing. <laughs> So it was fun. I, I, uh, I really did get a big kick out of, I didn't get to know her, by the way. I just, it was, a, it was great to see her and to watch the, the jazz and to watch what it is that we've created. And this is not Nikki's just here to say that white folks haven't done anything. They did a couple of good things, but it, it was, <laughs> well, they did. And actually, they, they, they gave us a good constitution if we can just keep it. But one of <laughs> One of the things that, that we're, we're dealing with here, and one of the things, one of the reasons, we're, we're very proud of you youngsters in college, because that's important, it's, 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 in, it's, in, it's incredibly important that you be in college. We who are parents, I'm, I'm a grandmother now, and I realized, I said to my students, uh, I teach on Tuesday evening, and I said to my students, and I think it's probably true, I said, I'm gonna get fired, and I think I probably will, because I've gotten to the, <laughs> to the point in life that what I care about is what does not exist. I used to care about what existed. I used to care about breaking down, my, my generation broke down, for example, we broke down segregation. And I do this in my class all the time. And I'll say that, we broke down segregation, and then I'll move over and I'll say, you live in a non-segregated world, but there's still racism. And so you have to make a decision how you wanna deal with it. But I know one thing, if people don't like you, you don't have any reason to like them. And I hear people sometimes saying things like, you know, well, the white folks don't like me. Well, you don't like them if you think about it. You don't wanna be bothered. And so there's no reason that your energy is being spent on people who don't like you. But in this university, I would bet you there's one white person who likes you. So your job is to find the white person who does. And when you find her and him or him, let them like you and stand up for them. You have a right to have a white friend. And we who are white ought to know we have a right to have a black friend. And we can't let the people who are afraid of color do something different. I'm a big fan, of course, of, 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 of I guess the term is gonna be homo, 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 what is the term? That you have a right to marry who you wanna marry. I don't know how to, how that's going to be. And I keep watching that because you can look in this room. Nobody's, nobody is upset, no matter what Trump and them say. Nobody is upset about the sex because black people and white people have been having sex since on the ship coming over. It's not the sex, it's the marriage. So why is it that we don't want two people of the same gender to be married? 
No, we, we can't allow that. No, you, if you don't want to, 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 to see two people of the same gender be married, don't marry them. That's so easy, marry somebody of another gender. But those of us who care about it have a right to marry who we want to marry. Am I making sense? And at some point, we who are black and we who are white and we who have sense have got to start to stand up for that which has not existed comfortably yet. It's time that we moved forward. I, I have ruined for my students, and I just want to share that, <laughs> this one thing. I have ruined for my students, and I've been at Tech for 30 years. I have ruined Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. <laughs> it's the dumbest thing on God's earth. <laughs> they, it is. We're just teaching kids to be bullies. They laugh at him. He had a very shiny nose, and if you ever saw him, etc. But all of the other reindeers, not some, not all of them, laughed and called him names. What kind of crap is that? I think... <laughs> I think it's racist. <laughs> Don't you? I have a friend, and we're working on a book, uh, Kay Graham, and I, I, Kay says that she thinks it's homophobic. I know one thing, they need to leave Rudolph alone. And <laughs> they do. And if Santa Claus had come to me, because I know it, it happens all the time. Then one foggy Christmas Eve, Santa comes to say, when Santa comes on that foggy eve, America came to Joe Lewis because they needed somebody to fight Max Schelling, right? America, when we, when we had the Olympics, America needed somebody to run and win a gold medal, so they called Jesse Owens. Though when Jesse came back, he couldn't go in the front door because he was black. Well, you get a little tired, is what I'm saying, of all of that, it's time to stop. If I had been Rudolph, I would have told Santa to kiss my red nose ass, and that would have been... <laughs> That would have been, no, oh, because you, you know that's not right. And you know that Mrs. Santa Claus is sitting there in the evening having a beer, watching these people mistreat Rudolph. So she had an obligation, and he had an obligation. And you and I have an obligation. When we're seeing people who are lonely and who are sad, we have an obligation to at least smile, to at least reach out. We want you to be in cop. We send you to college for a liberal education. And it's important. And I know that everybody's like, well, education is expensive. But there are two things that don't belong to you, and I have to remember to say that. One is your health. Your health is not yours. Your health belongs to all of us. And if you don't believe me, you can do one thing. We burned a ship. We burned more than one. But we burned a ship in the Caribbean Ocean because they said smallpox was abroad. And we burned that ship, and those people died because we wouldn't let smallpox come in. Smallpox is about health. We can do better. We, in our age, in our time, have had a problem with AIDS. We're having problems now with other health issues. Your health belongs to us. And what we want to do is to make sure you stay healthy. Therefore, we want to make sure that people who want to be doctors and nurses can go ahead and do that. That's, that's in, in, incredibly important. And the other thing that we want is your education. And when people tell me, well, education is, imp is, is expensive, I say, look at ignorance. <laughs> it's ignorance we can't afford. We have to find a way to go forward. And people like me, because I'm at that stage, I'm, I'm 74, so what, if I'm, I'm lucky I live another 10 years or so. So I'm going to miss a lot but you and your children are going to have a lot. And a part of your responsibility is to continue the journey that my generation started. We started the journey on a better, on a better, on a better uh, uh, trail. And you can do it too. You have the strength and you have the time. And somebody said, well, Nikki, I don't want to pay taxes. Well, if you don't pay taxes, make the rich people pay taxes. They have it. Donald Trump has money. That boy uh, that he, he married his daughter has money. Tax them. <laughs> but you and I need, you need, we need your education and we need your health. And these are just things that have to go forward and we have to be more generous. 
And I know that I wasn't invited here to say that. I was probably invited here to do poetry. So I want to read. <laughs> it's so nice to be where Gwen was. I, I can't imagine. I mean, just being in that area, it, it, it's sacred ground. I live in Appalachia, and so you always know when people know Appalachia because they say Appalachia, <laughs> and nobody says that but the people who don't live in Appalachia. <laughs> I look at, uh, by the way, which is neither here nor there, I guess, but I look at, um, I look at uh, Jeopardy, and Alex had a, uh, you know, and he prides himself on his ability to, to, to speak for, pr correctly. And he, he does that. And he had a question on Appalachia. And he said, Appalachia. And it's like, ah, you don't know. <laughs> we laughed at him. I'm a fun. I am. A, I was born in Knoxville, and I now teach at, at, at Blacksburg. And I'm fond of the, of the Appalachian community. I'm fond of it for a lot of reasons. One, probably the best people, in, and I mean no disrespect to anybody, but the best white people in America are Appalachians. And what they have done and what they did was they got pushed, as you know, into the mountains because the British and the Irish didn't want to be bothered with them. And they were crooks. You know, the, the basic reason you kick people out. And they ended up in the mountains. And ending up in the mountains became important to them because they were thinking, okay, I've been abused. And so when runaway slaves are coming up what we now know to be, and you can look this up, the Appalachian Trail, it was the white Appalachians who looked out for them. Even now, if you were just driving in Appalachia, it doesn't matter what, and you had a flat tire, you could have a flat tire in Appalachia because somebody will look out and, Pa, they got a, they got a flat tire, and Pa will come and help you. That's the truth. And she will say, you know, you want a glass of water? And you will come and sit on the porch while Pa changes your tire. These are great people. We know that the Appalachians separated from Virginia. And we know how in incredibly important that was because what we had, if Appalachia had not separated from Virginia, then we would have had Virginia going from the Atlantic Ocean to the Ohio River. That would have changed the Civil War, but the Appalachians took, they had balls, they had strength, and they said, no, we're not going to be a part of that. We are not going to send, if I may quote, we will not send our sons to die so that the Shenandoah can have slaves. And they didn't. They separated. And so we're very proud of that. We also know if you were a runaway slave and you saw a, 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 a quilt, and the quilt is hanging on the, on the, it's just hanging on the porch, you knew that that was a safe house. You knew that you could go and somebody would hide you or somebody would feed you, somebody would take care of you. We know at night, if you were going up the Appalachian Trail and you saw a, 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 a lantern, you knew that that was, a safe, that was a safe place. And what bothers me, frankly speaking, is how much we have allowed the hatred other people to take the beautiful history of Appalachia and make it something else because these are great people and they need to fight for what their history is and for what they do. I wrote a poem when God made mountains because if I was going to make earth, there are a lot of things that I would, well first thing you're going to do of course and God doesn't need me, but the first thing you're going to do is you're going to say I need water. What do you need? You need water because you know that. I mean we could right here pick up anything. We pick a, a, a any kind of, go outside and pull something. If we want it to grow, we're going to put it in water. And sometimes it'll grow, sometimes it won't. Sometimes it'll be a flower, sometimes it'll be a weed. These are not things we know, but we know we put it in water. So God is going to say, okay, I need a few oceans, so he's going to get that done. But then I want some, I would like some, some, some land, so we've got some land going. And it's going to sort of begin to work. And then he's going to look at it and he made runaway slaves with no book knowledge of the North Star, nor botany classes describing moss on the north side of the trees. He made black men and women unafraid of mountain lions and Florida panthers. And no matter what Teddy Roosevelt tried to show, bears do not like people. Not the cuddly little koala, not the fierce grizzly, nor the mighty polar, nor the humble mountain black bear. All bears and their dens are to be avoided. God did make the jackrabbit who could be snared. 
God made the possum who is slow. God made the clever raccoon and rivers sweet with fish. He made berries and nuts and green leafy things which were safe and good to eat. When God made runaway slaves, he knew they would need a friend, not only in nature, but of a human kind. So he sent mountaineers. He sent white people who would not be a slave nor own one, who would not kill a slave or holder nor die for one. He sent a free white man who believed in change and a free white woman who believed in him. And they made their, their home in these mighty mountains. They liked to have a drink or two, so they welcomed Johnny Appleseed, who brought stories and fermented Applejack. They liked heroes, so they welcomed the traveling preacher with his message of a man who had trampled, who had trampled out the village where the, grapes of vine, where the grapes of wine are crushed. He liked to sing, so they welcomed the runaway slave with his banjo, and friendships were formed. When God made mountains, he made men and women who would need each other, who would respect each other, who would carry the word so that all men and women could be saved. When God made mountains, he said, come unto me, ye who need rest. And they called it Appalachia, the original word for peace. And some folks said, this cannot be done. And the rest said, yes, we can. And the cloud settled in that welcome place between ground and trees and sky, like smoke coming off a coffee pot, like steam coming from a kettle of pinto beans, like the rustic smell. The one I've been traveling with is a book called A Good Cry. And I'm the baby in the family, and I don't know if any of us are baby in the families, but babies, are. we do a whole different thing. And it's because, well, my older sister, uh, her name was Gary Ann, her name was Gary, we called Gary Ann, and Gary was, uh, first of all, she had dimples, so she was really, you know, everybody loves dimples. Oh, Gary's dimple. And <laughs> it was fine, I didn't mind, I don't have dimples. And Gary had smooth skin, it was clear, and you can see I don't have smooth, so you can see what, what's happening with the baby there. And, and Gary was talented. She, she could sing, she could play the piano, she could dance. And I couldn't do any of those things. And Mama used to laugh. She said, you know, when, when you were little, you know, when somebody would say, Nikki, can you read? You'd say, no, but Gary can, you know. And so they kind of laughed at me because I, I couldn't do any of these things. And I, I couldn't, I don't think I, I don't think I missed it. Maybe I, I did, but nonetheless, that's, that's, the way, <laughs> that's the way that goes. And so it, it was just always interesting to be the baby because the baby observes, baby watches. Some of you are babies and you know that you've been watching all the time, and I, I watched. I used to tease my mother because my father, which I finally learned to, to deal with, if you would ask me, what am I doing on Saturday night at about 11 o'clock, I am listening to my father hit my mother. Now my sister, um, among other things, was, was friendly, so she had friends. I'm not friendly, and I don't have a bunch of friends. So I was at home, but Gary always, she would leave on Friday. After school, she would pack her little overnight bag, and she would leave because she didn't want to hear it, I guess, or something. But I would be home, and I was always thinking, there has to be a way that I could take care of my mother, but there wasn't. And so it was something that I had to learn to recognize as none of my business and just kind of let it go. But as we got older, Gus got, uh, he had a stroke, and then he had a heart attack. And mommy called me, I was living in New York, and she said, well, your father's in the hospital. Well, she knew I didn't care, because I didn't like him. And so, <laughs> I didn't. And so I figured if she's calling me, she's calling because she wants me to, she needs me. So I packed up, I had a little Volkswagen, I had a son, and I had a dog. And we, we went home, and I'm sitting there and I'm laughing, we went back to mommy's house, and I'm laughing, I said, girl, you should have married me, and you wouldn't have these problems. And she would say, well, if I married you, I wouldn't have you, you know, that, how, how would I get you? And I said, well, you know, we're gonna figure out a way for, for human being, for, for human female to lay an egg, and then we'll figure out what we want to, how we want to uh, fertilize it. And that would be, I feel that's a good idea for those of you in the science. If we can figure out, well, yeah, because that way, then you get things like Trump, and you can figure out, we're not fertilizing that one, you can scramble that. And, you know, go on about your, your business. But I, I always thought that mommy should marry me, and actually we ended up living together 30, 30 years. But the one thing that I never learned because I kept it in, was I didn't learn how to cry. And some of you probably here with me today, don't cry. You just 
keep it in. You just go on and do what you're, you're going to do. You just don't keep it. And I thought, okay, now, <laughs> I started writing this book two years ago. I was 72 years old. I realized that I need to learn how to cry because, one, I had, uh, I had a seizure. And seizures are because you keep things in. And my doctor is Gregory, and Gregory's a nice guy, and Gregory's cute. So it's always a pleasure to see Gregory. <laughs> well, it, it always pays to be cute. For those of you who aren't, we love you too, but it always, <laughs> it always pays to be cute. And I was saying to Gregory, I said, Greg, you know, you need to figure something out because I'm, I don't have, I didn't have a, a seizure because I'm keeping, you know, it, it's not what you think. He thinks I, uh, he, well, because I'm black too. You eat too much salt and, you know, he goes through that thing. I said, no, Greg, I think that I had a seizure because I never learned to cry. I never learned to let it out. And I think you should study me and then you should name it, you know, then you can name it the Nikki and you could write it up and, you know, people would come to you and say, well, how do you treat the Nikki? And you could, <laughs> you know, and you could make some money and you would be happy with it. He hasn't exactly seen my point yet, but I know I'm right about that. I wrote a poem because I did. I married my mother. I would have always married my mother. And when I lost my mother, when my mother whittled me, and there's no other way around it, I had to find, um, I had to find a replacement because there's nothing. You have to have somebody who loves you, who doesn't criticize you. And one of the things that, that mommy and I got along with, uh, well, even my grandmother. Grandmother didn't, wasn't big at criticizing me, but grandmother did. Think, grandma, <laughs> I've been telling stories all day. Let me tell you this one. Grandmother, no, grandmother could play the piano, and she was good. People say that Negroes don't know how to keep money. I don't know about anybody else, but I know my grandmother found a way to buy a piano. So we can just roll that back. I'm born in 1943. Grandmother was able to purchase a piano, and it's in the living room. It was in the living room. So that's going to be there. My sister, Gary, could play the piano. My cousin, William, could play the piano. My other cousin, my younger cousin, Terry, learned to play the piano. So grandmother's calling everybody. We spent the, our summers with her. And she would call him, and Gary would come in, and Gary would be playing Clarity Loon, and she'd be playing, you know, Spar Spangled Band, all of that crap. She could play that. William and them could play that, but William liked to play the blues, so he'd doom, 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 doom. And grandmother was pleased with that. Terry, who became a minister, liked to play spirituals, and, you know, he could do that. And then she would say, because I'm going to be the last one, Nikki. And I would go in, and I did this twice, and that was going to be the end of it. And she's trying to teach me, these are your scales. And, you know, I loved grandmother, I truly do, and I wanted to please her. And so I was trying to do the do, re, mi, and I hit the wrong scale. And grandmother had a little yellow pencil, <laughs> and she hit my hand. And I said, grandmother, I'll never forget that. If you're going to be abusive, I'm not going to sit here. <laughs> and grandmother said, abusive? I'll be damned. And that, I cannot play the piano. <laughs> and it's, it's probably my fault. But I married my mother. <laughs> I know crying is a skill. I automatically wipe my eyes, even though I know crying is a skill. Maybe I will learn, my mother did when she thought I was asleep. I think my sister did, sleep. But sleep is as difficult to me as crying. I laugh easily and I smile and withhold any true feelings, except once I fell in love with my eighth grade teacher and spent most of my life trying to feel safe again, though maybe I'm safe now, after almost 30 years, which is as long as I live with my mother. Maybe that's not a poem. Maybe that's something else. Maybe I just wanted to show my father that he needn't be cruel. Maybe I just enjoyed buying the house he had to live in, showing her she should have married me instead of him. Or maybe, since we will all soon be gone, I should be happy I found my mother in someone else who loves me. What else really matters? I love that. I am a Fisk University graduate, and I know there are a couple of Fisk people here. And my president at Fisk was um, uh, uh, Walter Leonard. And I don't know, probably nobody but me, it depends on your age, is here with Walter Leonard. 
uh, Walter, uh, I love Walter, and, and uh, Walt, his wife's name was Betty. And Walter and Betty just became close to me and, and I to them. And he finally retired from Fisk, I shouldn't say finally, but, uh, and, and moved, uh, you know, he retired and moved. And I was always thinking, well, I love Walter, and, and so bringing him in, Betty called me one day and she said, um, Walter had, had a, a heart attack. And she said it in a way that I knew it wasn't, this, this is not gonna be good, this is not gonna work. I like stones. These, and I, I wear these all the time, I travel in these. These are, as you see, they're small, but they are diamonds, and I like diamonds. And Mommy gave me these for my uh, 40th birthday, and you can see. And I, I like them, and I wondered, as I do, because sometimes you're just having days, sometimes you just need something, and I have these on and I will feel them, and I will maybe feel that mommy gave them to me. I don't know, but it's, it's more than just, oh, I have a pair, losing Walter. And I was thinking about what happens when you walk down the street, and all of us have walked down the street and kicked a rock. And sometimes you kick a rock, and it's just a rock, and the rock is in the way, and you kick it. But sometimes you're walking down the street, and you see a rock, and there's something about that rock, and you don't know what, but you pick it up, and there's something that you feel about that rock. And the rock is saying something to you. There, there's something happening, and you keep it. You put it in your pocket, and, and, and you, go, you go on home. I know enough to know at my age, and there's at least one other person in this room about my age, I know enough to know that everything that's a bad sentence, but everything changes. We talk about death, but I'm not a fan of death. I, I, I'm old enough to know that it's not death, it's a transition. And maybe the transition simply is that once we go to what is, whatever the other side is, we choose not to come back. It's not that we can't, it's that we don't want to. And we, get, we feel it in another kind of way. So when you're feeling something like a rock, that rock used to be somebody because there was a time a thousand years ago, 2,000 years ago, when that person, when somebody died and we put them in the ground, we put the body in the ground, that body is going to keep changing, changing, changing. It's going to finally come down to the bones or something is going to be a little rock. And it's going to be that somebody who put them there in that ground loved them. And when we encountered that, we felt the love. And I thought that that was important. I wanted to share that. With, 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 with Betty, because we've, we, we have, we've lost Walter, but it's not that we've lost Walter, it's simply we have put his body in the ground. We were, I was talking earlier, you know, if you just pull a, if you pull a, 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 a weed, some people will say that's a weed and throw it away, and some people say it might be a flower, and they'll keep it. And I'm saying to all of us, what we're all trying to do is find that thing that when we touch it, it answers us. And I think that it's time that human beings quit laughing at our spirits because we keep saying, ooh, spirits don't exist, but spirits have to exist because we've come these millions of years now. Earth has come all of these years. It has to be a good spirit that has gotten us to where, where we are. And when Betty called me, I wrote a poem for, for, for Walter and I'm calling it, I call it Heritage. We read it, of course, at his, um, at his funeral. The folk here, because he was in an old folks home, he's in the hospital, he's not gonna make it. The folk here are old. There are wheelchairs and people struggling to push them. There are sad-eyed people looking up from beds they cannot stretch out in. And some simply cannot move their heads. All will become something precious, sapphires, emeralds, rubies, which will be discovered by other explorers who will polish and shape the stones, and we, will never, and we will wear them, never knowing whose loved one we have embraced. Oh, thank you. I, I love that because I just like to keep, there just has to be something. Don't you think there just has to be something, something else? I, um, a long time ago,
See, they, I feel sorry for my Deltas because they've been listening to me talk all day. But a long time ago, uh, we, we had a Vietnam War, which we shouldn't have had. And one of the things that happened was that a, a, a wonderful, lovely man named Muhammad Ali refused to be inducted into it. And so now we got Ali is not going to do it. And they're going to take Ali's uh, belt away from him. And it's like he doesn't, he doesn't care. But Ali and I had something in common. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> but Ali and I had something in common as a woman named Victoria Lucas who worked for a, a, a man who, who, who helped to uh, 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 do things for Ali, you know, to, to, to uh, set up his fights. And Victoria said to me, because I was then reading poetry and I was becoming known, and she was saying, you know, you know, Nikki, Ali needs to do something. Ali needs to, he has to go and, and he has to, he has to do something because he's Muhammad Ali and he can't let these people keep him down. She said, would you like to read with him? Would you like to go with him? I said, you gotta be kidding. First of all, Ali is really, he's a nice guy. He really is a nice guy. And of course I'm happy to, to go with him. I said, of course I am. Ali, which you may not know, traveled by bus and I don't have time to travel by bus. I do now because I'm older, but at that point, I'm flying. <laughs> His wife, of course, liked me being with Ali because she thought I was on the bus, and therefore, he was behaving himself. <laughs> I was not on the bus, <laughs> and he was not behaving himself. <laughs> and so I would see his wife, she would say, how was the trip? And I didn't say I wasn't where you thought I was. I would just say, oh, the trip was really, was really nice, because there's no point in none of my business what, <laughs> what Ali did. <laughs> but we finally got to the, the point, we're now up to date. I just wanted to share that one, but we're up to date. And one of the things that's gonna happen is that a, a guy who's crazy and now still in jail named O.J. Simpson is gonna be not acquitted of not killing his wife, which I'm glad that he did, because I didn't think he did, but that's, I'm not having that, this is not a discussion about that. <laughs> but nonetheless, I thought when O.J. was not acquit, was, was acquitted, he should have gone straight to LAX. He, he was in, gone to the airport, gotten on a plane, and gone to D.C. and thanked, because we're now having the, the Million Man March, and thanked the black men for sending good spirits for supporting him. But of course, a OJ is crazy and, well he is, and now he's back in jail for some other things. I wanted to write a poem. I'm the mother of a son and I only have one. I didn't, I was never blessed with a, well I have, I'm not blessed with anybody, but I, it would have been, I didn't mind having a son, but it would have been nice to have a daughter too because daughters are so, are so precious. But I have a son, and when he was a little boy, you know, you worry about your sons, no matter, I guess, really what color you are, but you definitely, if you're black, worry about, about your sons. And I thought the Million Man March was one of the most wonderful things. I'm not a, a Muslim. Uh, I do know Louis Farrakhan, but we're not friends. And of course, he does, I smoked then, so you can see I have nothing to say to Louis, because you know, I smoke and drink, and he didn't do either, you know, so these things are, <laughs> are going to happen. But I wanted to, I wanted to write a, a, a poem for the young men, because I think even today, or especially today, nobody is giving black men the credit. And I think that they deserve a lot, a lot of love. And I think if little old ladies like me are not going to send the love out, I don't know who is, because they face a lot. To be a black man, well, to be a black man at any time, is a problem, and that's only fair to say. And just think, the, the, the one, Nikki, makes sense here. The one thing that I really love, I love the blues, and one thing I love about black men in the blues was that they have a line, put on your red dress, honey, baby, cause we going out tonight. And I thought of all of the things that black men can do, they found a way to have joy. And they would come in, out of sharecropping, overworked and underpaid, and they could still come in and say, put on your red dress, baby, because we're going out tonight.
there's a house party way across town, people coming from miles around. It's because we couldn't go anyplace else. And it's so wonderful. And I think that America has, I think that they have jealous, they're, they're jealous that whatever it was, we still found a way to find joy. But if you were a black man taking your baby out to a house party and you take her home, if you were going someplace else, what are your chances of making it home alive? Not good that some people will pull up, some guys, and they'll lynch you or they'll beat you. Not good. And so you have to really love that step that black men took to say, but we're going out tonight. We, we're going to do something. We're going to, we're going to find a way to be cheerful. We're going to find love no matter what. And every time I listen to love songs that black men write, there's just no way around it. You have to love them for doing that because everything in the world says, and I said, you know, Earl, I'm, I'm upset with my father. I, I, I don't see any reason that he should have been upset with my mother because she loved him. And I hope that none of you who are men in this room would ever even think about hitting your, 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 your girlfriend or, or your wife or whatever you got because she's just trying to love you. And all she wants you to do is stay alive. And what you have to do is appreciate that. And you're gonna say, well, you know, what happens is that we're upset because we don't have nothing. We don't have no money. Well, you didn't have no money when you were fucking me. So why would you have money now? It, no, it, it's time. I know I won't be invited back, but it's time. <laughs> no, it's, you have to grow up. It's time you accept the love that we're offering. It's time that everybody accepts the love that we're offering. You let everybody love like they want to and you love like you want to. I wrote a poem and yeah, this is a love poem. It's not that I don't reject, respect the brother in Baltimore or Washington or even some parts of Northern Virginia because I do. It's just that this is different. The brother who had to wake up before dawn, get into a car may or, that may or may not have needed a new muffler, a set of spark plugs, some attention to the motor, but who decided nonetheless that yes, he had to heed the call to go to Washington, D.C. That's the brother I want to talk about. Not at all, please understand, that I don't have a high regard for the brother who got on a bus. Getting on buses has always been a central revolutionary act of black America. Just ask Plessy or, Fer or Parks. Getting on a bus is an act of responsibility, an act of bravery, an act of commitment to change. But the brother who rose from his warm bed, who made his own coffee because his wife pretended to be asleep because she was scared that he might not come back alive, and she didn't let, want to let him know that it, to see that fear in, his eye, in her eyes because he might not come back alive. That's the brother I want to talk about here. I want to talk about the young brother who just didn't understand why everything, no matter how hard he tried, never seems to come out right. How, if he goes bowling and gets nine pins, the tenth pin would just stand there, mocking the ball, headed for the gutter. How, if he bumped into someone on the street and said a simple, I'm sorry, someone else would jump in his face. But if he didn't say anything, then someone would say he was uncouth. Or how sometimes people would even deliberately run into him, so he joined with other people like him. And instead of calling it a benevolent society or a brotherhood or something wonderful and romantic like Elks and Masons and Lions and Rotarians, they call it a gang, indicating it was a nest of vipers. And terms like that, indicating things that we find dirty and unacceptable. How when four or five white boys rape a mentally handicapped girl, they say he, they are just exercising bad judgment. But when four or five black boys rape a jogger, they are all animals. And this is not about any brother who rapes any female. And it's not for anyone who hurts women or any other vulnerable life forms, but just a word or two about the black boys who don't understand why everything they ever tried to do just never seems to come out right. And I think, of course, yes, why wouldn't they cry themselves to sleep? when all they want and all they really want to know is denied them? Why wouldn't they be afraid of the dark? Why wouldn't their hearts be broken when people they love, mothers, fathers, aunts, uncles, girlfriends, good buddies, teachers, preachers, all turn out to be untrue? And please don't tell me that basketball and baseball and football aren't the way to go, that they should get their education, when their education will teach them to get a talent because people who get up, if not out of these cesspools we call the inner city, have something more than a high school degree behind them. And you have to be some kind of real fool not to see that, they who make the, that those who make the money and who doesn't. This is for the brothers, however, 
who does indeed believe that there can be, should be, and must be a change. It's not that I am in any way unhappy about the brother who has a fine home, a car that is always serviced on time, a job with health benefits, a pretty wife, happy, smart children, a dog that obeys. I'm proud and happy for him and his because I know a people cannot do better unless individuals do better. But this is about the brother who stands on the street corners singing five-part a cappella harmony, and the brother who does break dancing under street lights, and the brothers who created rap because they took music classes away. So the brothers created scratch, then they invented CDs. So the brothers rapped, and they said rap is the enemy of women, as if Bob Dole and Rush Lumbach and self-satisfied Republicans with bumper sticker mentalities don't exist. So this is for the brother who is simply trying to find a way to soothe his soul, while everyone wants to make him the reason America is off track. And this is about the brother who, knowing he is a better person than even he thinks he is, got in his car in Detroit or Cincinnati or St. Louis and headed for Washington, not knowing if he would be the only brother to show up for the Day of Atonement, but knowing if he was the only brother, then on this day, at this time, he would be the brother to stand and say to himself, his brother, and the folks who he loves and who love him, I am sorry things are not different. And that's a mighty powerful thing to say because people want to make you make miracles when all any of us can say is, I wish it would be different. But this is for the brother who was willing to be the only brother so that if there would be laughter as he stood alone on the mall, he still said, I will stand today. And it doesn't matter if I'm alone. I need to stand and testify. And yeah, this is a love poem for that brother who decided for this one point in time, I will be my better self. And we are all so very proud of you. I want to close on one of my favorite poems. <laughs> and my kids, every night I look at, um, at, at we were talking about it earlier, I look at Jeopardy. And uh, it's just a habit, I, I need to get out of it. And, um, I look at that other thing, deal or no deal. deal. Remember deal or no deal? And it, deal or no deal is stupid because people are greedy. And, and one of the reasons they don't ever get anything is that, that uh, they, they shouldn't. I, I couldn't be on Jeopardy because I can't spell, and they're always having spelling things. But deal or no deal is me. And, and one day, because I was really hurt, one day they had a question on deal or no deal, and I should have been, I should have been the answer. <laughs> and I was disappointed. You know, it's one of those things you come into the class, and I said to my class, you know, I, I, I should have been on deal or no deal. And they're looking at me like, oh, God, she's in one of those. <laughs> and it's like, okay, I'll tell you why. But I wrote this, and I, I want to share this because they laughed. They were laughing at me. And I didn't think that they should. I didn't think they should laugh at me. I think that they should sympathize <laughs> with, with, with me because, you know, I think that I should apply to deal or no deal. I wrote the poem. My class is not sure that I should apply to deal or no deal. They think I'm lucky after all. I am teaching them. They know that I am smart. They are, for example, learning, yet they don't want to see me make those greedy mistakes and push beyond the envelope. The banker is neither friend nor foe. He's a machine. To think you can beat him is to think you will win at Vegas or love, but I persist. My dream is a red dress above my knee, high-heeled red sandals, and me coming over the top, the music booming, boom, 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 boom. Hi, Howie, I will say with a lovely smile. I don't want to play the game. I want to be it. They were born 40 years after me, yet I am younger. I know you cannot go through life unless you are willing for love or money to make a fool of yourself. Where else does the ecstasy lie?
Once again, thanks to you, Nikki Giovanni, for joining us this evening. Thanks to all of you for coming out. This has just been a great evening. We appreciate your support for events such as this. Remember, Women's History Month, continue to come out and support all of the activities and events that will be sponsored through the Women's Center. Again, thanks so much for coming out. Safe travels home. Thank you.